Have we hit any of these slides yet? And we talked about accessing individual characters in a string and things like that. My hunch is no, we have not, but is that true? Is this looking new? New stuff? All right, all right. Okay, so we've seen a little bit lists. A list is just a sequence of things, right? L is equal to, you know, 8, 700, whoopsie, separated my commas. Right, like that. And then if I want to pull them out individually, I access them by their so-called so subscript, their index number. L subscript 0 is that first element. L subscript 1 is the second. L subscript 2 is the third. And L subscript 3 is the fourth element. The length of that list is 4, right? So I use the LAN function. It returned me the length of the list. The length of the list is 4, so I'm able to access elements 0, 1, 2, and 3. Well, a string is a sequence of characters, typewritten characters, right? From the keyboard input or what, that, what you're going to display as the output. Same idea. In, short for name, is equal to Jeff. What's the length of Jeff? It's 4. Length of in? It's in fact, 4. So, if I do, let me try to push this up. If I do in subscript 0, it's going to give me the first letter of the name. J. In subscript 1, give me the second letter, E. In subscript 2, F. In subscript 3, F. Now, I'm at the end of the name. It was a link to 4, so I was able to access elements index 0 through 3. That's 1, 2, 3, 4. 0 through 3. So it's effectively, you can access elements from 0 up to length minus 1. So what if I wanted that last character and I didn't know how long the string was going to be, right? If I did this, I'm not going to count it to figure out how long that string is. I could get that position using the length function. And this is kind of tedious. I could do in len in minus 1, right? Give me the length of the string. Subtract for like 1 from it and use that as my index. All right, and it did, in fact, find the last character. Now, Python, and this is the only language that I've seen that does this, and I think it's really cool. It's one of my favorite features of the language, is if you do that, negative 1, it starts counting from the end rather than the beginning. That's character negative 1. That's character negative 2. That's character ne negative 3. And lists work the same way, although I never demonstrated it like that. And so on. So if you go past the end of the list, though, right, or the string, I want element number 900, index out of range. Doesn't work. So you can only go up to length minus 1. Or if you're going to negative, you know, numbers, you can only go up, you know, to the length the other way. So a string is just a series of ASCII characters or Unicode characters, depending upon whether you're using 8-bit characters or 16-bit characters. Things like the Python editor and notepad and simple stuff that you type in on the keyboard are usually stored as ASCII characters. You can load up the ASCII table.com and we can see what they are. H-I space T-H-E-R-R-E exclamation point. This is a string of length 9, so we can access elements 0 through 8. What if we want a subset of them? What if I just want the first two out of that? I can use what's known as slicing. That gets us a substring of it. I think it's about time to actually start coding this in.
So I have some sentence. I'm going to store it in a string. Hi there, exclamation point. And I want to extract, I just want to print out the word hi, and not the whole thing. And here's one way to do it. This is stupid, but I could do it this way. Print, parentheses, s subscript 0 plus s subscript 1. Right, that's going to give me the h and the i. And when I say it's stupid, it's not stupid. It's just that there, we have probably better ways of doing it. Why do I say that? What if we wanted, like, you know, that to that? Or what if the sentence was very long and I wanted that from that? I would not want to have to, you know, add that many characters together, concatenate that many characters. Instead, I will use what's known as slicing. Slicing is when you put this kind of syntax, but you have a colon inside your subscript to indicate which characters you want. So print s subscript starting at 0 and going up to but not including 2. Just kind of like the range. If you specify a range of 10, it goes up to but not including 10. Now it's going to also print out high. So that up to but not including thing throws people off. If we look at it, this is character 0, that's character 1, and that's character 2. The way I think about it is starting at 0, and I want it to be two characters long, so add 2 to 0, so I'm going to put a 2 there. Like, what if I wanted this one? If I wanted the word there without the exclamation point? Well, this is character 0, 1, 2, that's character 3. And how long is the word there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so I'm going to do 3 colon... And then 3 plus 5 is 8. <coughs> so now it's going to print there. So what I did not do while I was thinking about it is go, I need to find that position and specify it. Instead, I just said, I want the starting position, and then I want, you know, five characters past that, since the length of that word was five. So three plus five is eight. I'm going to add some comments that this prints out high, this as well, and this prints out there. If I want the exclamation point, what am I going to change? I'll make that a 9 so that it goes out and grabs that character as well, so that it grabs 6 characters. The difference between 9 and 3 is 6. Lists and strings A lot of functions, a lot of functionality are almost the same thing. And what do I mean by that? If we have a list, we could be using the same tactics to take slices. So list is equal to, and I'm going to just make a list, red, end quote, comma, blue, end quote, comma, green, end quote, comma, yellow, end quote, comma, orange. Right? Some random list. All right. I can access each one of them individually. Print L subscript 1, right? Which one is that going to print? Red, third, blue. Yep. Your mind went for red, but since we're using zero base indexing, you are correct. It goes for blue. What if I want a list that starts there and gets the two after it as well? Print. L, so I wanted it to start as blue, so I do that, but I want it to go for a total of three. So one plus those three, four, like that. And now it's going to print out blue, green, and yellow. One thing to note about that is that when we printed out just one element, we 
you've got that element as it as a string, or if it was an integer, it would have been an int or whatever. But when we use slicing, it actually returned a sublist. This is a new list. We can tell it's a list because when it printed it out, it put the square braces around it. What if we had a string and we wanted to turn it into a list? Like we have this string. String is equal to, quote, and I'm just going to type in some words. Ice, plates, bread, butter, jam. Stuff that we may need for our, for our trip out here. So here we go. We're going to do this. L is equal to S dot split, parentheses, in parentheses. And inside the parentheses, I'm going to tell it to split based on spaces. Now, that's not strictly necessary in this case. If I leave that off, it's still going to split it appropriately. But I like going ahead and letting us know which character it's going to be splitting on. And then I better print the list out. Yeah, bless you. Or else we won't see the results of our handiwork. There we go. And so it took that string. I mean, we could print that one out too, right? Let's print the string. I put that on the line above the print L. And when I run it, we see that it chopped our string apart and stored it in a list. My mind flaked up for a moment. Let me see. Join a list into a string python. Alright, this is going to look crazy and I may not concentrate on it for long, but now we have this list. We can join it back together with anything as a separator that we want. We can do something like this. String equals, and this syntax is very strange, I want everything for some reason to be separated by a plus sign. So quote plus end quote dot join parentheses L. We want to join that list together using the plus sign to connect them all. And that's a pretty weird syntax. And then let's print that back out. Yep, and there we go. It turned our list into a string separated by pluses. And we could split that back out if we wanted to. Could you just put a space there instead of a plus? Yeah, if we put a space there, then it'll be all nicely separated by spaces. It'll look like it, it did originally. You put a smiley face. This is a strange one, but what if you do this? Put a backslash in there. They put new lines after every one of them. Or tab, backslash T. Try to tab it out. So a lot of what we learn about lists and a lot of what we learn about string apply to each other. We can get the length of a list the same way we can get the length of a string. N is equal to len L. That's going to give us the number of items in that list, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If we did N is equal to len S, it would instead be the length of the string, which is much longer, right? 
this is number of items, elements, in the L list. And this is the number of characters in the S string. What if you want to process everything letter by letter or element by element in your string? string because I'm tired of that one about ice bread and plates and whatever. So how about S equals quote, I like pizza, end quote. And then now for, wait, for CH standing for character, NS colon, print character. That's going to go from beginning to end, printing out every character in the string. Print out CH plus an exclamation point just to make it more emphatic. Actually, just to distinguish it from the uh, prior output. Right? And so there it printed it. I like pizza. What if we want to know the numeric values of those characters? We want to know the ASCII values of those characters. If you go to ASCII table.com or some other ASCII chart, we will see that a lowercase a has an ASCII value of 97, and a b is one greater than that, 98, and a c is one greater than that, 99. So in your computer, if you had the string ABC stored, then really it's just got a byte with a 97 followed by another byte with 98 followed by another byte with 99 in it. So instead of printing out an exclamation point, let's print the ordinal value of that character out, ASCII value of that character. So now it says, I like pizza, but we're seeing the ASCII characters. So since I have that string stored in memory that says, I like pizza, I know that the computer has stored in its RAM a byte with a 73 in it, a 32, a 108, a 105, all in sequence all the way out to the end. Space is a 32, notice that. Can you convert from an ordinal number and ask you value back to a character? Now let's see, see if I remember how. For x in range, starting at 65, and going up to, what is the value of z on our ASCII table.com? Z is 90, so I'm going to go to 91. One past the end. Call it. So I'm going to print x, and then I'm going to print the character value of x. C-H-R-X. see what it did? It printed out all the ASCII characters from capital A to capital Z. For funsies, let's change that to 1 up to 256. And then I better stop and make sure that everybody, nobody has typos. We're going to print out the entire ASCII chart except for character 0. And if we wanted character 0, we could put that there as well. And there they go. Now, I don't know how to do this on a Mac keyboard, but if you wanted to type in one of these characters and get it to display on your screen, like that super cool one, or I think that means yen, or, you know, the sense. Say I want to print out a sense sign for my program. <clears throat> I've already forgotten what it was. Let me go back and look at it again. It's a 162. Okay, so print, parentheses, quote, if I hold the Alt key down, 
and keeping it pressed down, type in 162 on the numeric keypad and then let up, it doesn't work. Okay, if it's not going to work, that's all right. Press numlock, 162. Okay, doesn't work. Sorry about that. In a lot of contexts, you can use that to enter long ASCII values. Let me try to prove it using notepad 162. Okay, well, I guess that is our symbol. Press 0162. 162. Usually wants four characters on most of them. Well, that's interesting. What is 161160? Okay, yeah, so cool. Awesome. <coughs> Try that again. 0162. And there I got my sense sign. That's just for fun, just so you know how that you can access those ASCII characters, and if you happen to memorize them, then you can insert a symbol for a heart, you know, or something like that into your text. Hold the Alt key down, and then type in, keeping the Alt key down, 0, 1, 6, 2, and then let up on the Alt key. Yeah, you have to use the, uh, the numeric keypad. I do not believe it will work with the number keys. That's correct. That's not. But if I didn't know how to type that, if I was on the Mac, I could have printed CHR parentheses 162, and it should print out that character. Yep. So even though I don't have the sense sign on my keyboard, I could say, you know, U, O, you know, one, two, three, end quote, plus that character. And I'll say one, two, three, followed by the set sign. What if I want to see if something is in a string or not? I want to find out if the letter Z is in my neat string up here. Use the IN keyword, IN. If, quote, Z, end quote, IN, S, if it's in our string, quote, or colon, if Z, in S, colon, print, found a Z. Now let's look for another character. There was no Y in it, so if I do this, if, quote, Y, end quote, I N S colon, print, found a Y, it is going to print that it found a Z, but it's not going to print that it found a Y. And you can use the same thing inside of a list. Way up here, I had some list colors. Well, I've, I've changed the list too many times, so I don't know what's in it anymore. L is equal to square, and I'm just going to type in my favorite series of numbers, 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. You can just type in whatever numbers you want. And then looking at it, this does not have a 2 or a 3. You ever wondered how they came up with that phone number for, for Jenny? All right. Oh, come on. Right. Eight six seven five three. Oh nine. Kind of out of it. So there's no others. No four, no two, no one. Oh, songwriter. So if I wanted to confirm that the, those numbers are not in it, I could do this. If four in L colon print found four, end quote, in parentheses, else print no four found.
Right. So there was, in fact, no 4 there. I know that there's a 9, so if I copied this and changed all the 4s to 9s, it would tell me that there was a 9 in it. Just opening up some preform notes. You can use a for loop to traverse a list or string. Right. So for ch in s, if it's a string, I like using ch meaning character, right? Or if it's a list, for e or l or x or whatever your favorite variable is, for v value in the list, something like that. That'll let you traverse the string. The first element of a string or list is index subscript 0. The last one is index length of the string minus one. So another way of printing through a list would be to do it based on its index value. So rather than doing four character in the string, we could use a range statement. For i in range, LEN parentheses S in parentheses in parentheses. So starting at zero and going up to S, the length minus one, print parentheses S subscript I, the character at that position. And let's do, uh, let's use the end clause to stop it from not all being on the same line. I mean, um, filling it up with a whole bunch of extra lines. So end equals quote, space, quote. And then we better put one final print at the end of it to just like hitting return after typing a long, long line of text on your keyboard. And so that should print out our string. And so it printed out I like pizza with everything separated by spaces. What's the difference between using that and dot join? Not much, except we join makes a new piece of data, right? Whereas this is just using a for loop to iterate through it. So I'm going to add a comment to that one saying what we just did. Use a for loop. I'm going to call this a for index loop. print the list of the string out by its index values to traverse a list or string. So that would have worked with whether we did L there or S there. L happens to be our list, S happened to be our string, but the end result is going to be the same. It printed out the uh, numbers of our list, 8675309, with, with spaces between it. I think it was more interesting to see it when it was S string, so I'm going to put that back there. So it's just not wanting to find those characters. Right. Um, if you are seeing strange symbols when you run this, especially the folks using uh, Notepad++ or TextPad or whatever to run this, then what that probably means is it's the text is being displayed in a character set that doesn't have all those extra ASCII values. And what do I mean by that? When we were looking at the ASCII table, these are standard ASCII. These were the, the ones that have been defined since the 60s. Elements 0 through 127. That's 7 bits of data. 7 bits of data give you 128 possible choices. But then that gave you another 128. You could fill with whatever you wanted to. 
So some people have done this, right? What was that 162 we kept using over and over? On uh, idle, it showed up as a set sign. Here, this is showing us the O with, you know, kind of the Apple stock thing. If this is based upon which font it is being displayed in, or which regional encoding is being used. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at this, uh, there, there's not any Russian symbols in it, right? And if we look down here, I, I still may not see all the Russian, you know, alphabet characters that I want. And so, back in the old days, your browser had a place where you would pick which encoding you wanted to view the web page in. And if you went to a Russian website, it would look like garbage. You'd see some English text, but most of the characters would like, you know, be little squares that are filled in or question marks or something. And then you'd choose encoding, and you'd pick, you know, Russian, and it's instantly it looked good. It would swap this font out that didn't have those characters with another one that had all these mapped to those. So, you know, people made this up so that you could draw boxes on the screen and stuff like that. And so we had some extra characters. You know, for the Romance languages, eyes with umlauts and diacriticals and stuff like that. But this could be filled in by any sequence of special symbols that whatever the font designer wanted to use. So that's why you're, you're seeing different results is because it's being displayed in a different font with different character set. Same with uh, 1 through 31. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure. Um, those are considered, yeah, characters 1 through 31. Everything below 32 is considered a non-displayable character. It's supposed to be a character that's controlling the printer, right, or controlling a teletype machine. I'm going to backspace. I'm going to go a horizontal tab. I'm going to press my shift key, and then I'm going to release my shift key. And then, you know, some stuff that just make absolutely no sense to us whatsoever. So... I would have no way of guaranteeing what most of these are going to print. The only ones that should be common amongst them all is 10 for backspace. No, that's 8. And then NL, a new line, a slash in. And then a form fee, which would kick out a new page, but we don't even use that on our, on our, on our screens. And then a character turn. And it's weird to see character turn and line feed split up. But if you think about it, you can type on a typewriter, and hit the enter key, have it go all the way back, and not roll the flatten up to the next line. You might have been able to rig your typewriter to do that. Or if you needed to print multiple things on the same line, then you would want to send those signals out. And so in old versions of Windows, no, I won't say that. In, uh, in Windows, I'll tell you what, I don't think we've done this. Go ahead and go to a website called... Uh, hexed.it hex edit but there's a period before the last two letters hex h e x e d dot it why is this called a hex editor because it displays the contents of your files in what's known as hexadecimal it will display the ascii values of our files well, let's prove that. I'm going to open a file, and I'm going to go and upload one of my Python scripts to it. <coughs> there it is. Now, hexadecimal counting is a little bit different than uh, English, um, than our, our normal decimal counting. So, a, a is not a 65 in hexadecimal, it's a 41. It's just an alternate counting scheme that uses 16 digits rather than 10 digits like ours. And that's what is being displayed here. So if I found a capital A, on my hex editor, like right there, it's a 41. Say I wanted to be sneaky and say that this is no lo longer lecture in, it is lecture in. I'm going to actually close idle, and I'm going to change this. I'm going to increase its value by one. Well, what's one more than 4D? E comes after D, so if I type in 4E there, now it says in. I would have to save it, though, to actually get that change. And then when I open that back up in idle, I will see that letter has been changed. Okay. 
this isn't lecture in. This is it. So that's a representation of this file. This is how it looks in its in its RAM out in memory. It's just a sequence of bytes. Each ASCII value is a single byte. A byte is eight bits. A bit can hold a zero or a one. So if you have this, that's eight bits. How many different possible values are there for eight bits? Well, what if there were two bits? Zero, one. One bit gives you two possible values. What if you have two? Right? That's four different possible values. Two bits equals four possible values. What if you have three? That's eight, if I typed it right. Three bits equals eight possible values. Now I'm not going to keep going. Two to the power of the number of bits is the number of possible values that can be stored with that many bits. So. 2 to the power of 4, if we have 4 bits, you have 16 different possible values that could be stored in 4 bits. What if we have a byte's worth? 2 to the power of 8, 256. 2 to the power of 7, 128. Right. Now if your byte had more than, if your bit had more than 2 different possibilities, like if it we had some kind of trinary bytes or whatever, it would be 3 to the power of 4 or 3 to the power of 8 or whatever, but eh, we're talking about electricity, which is either on or off. So 8 bits can be one of 256 different possible values, 0 through 127. Now that's just for representation of text. The way that floats and ints are stored in memory it's completely different, right? If we store the number 893 as a string, then we will see that it matches. I mean, you know, I could go ahead and put in 893 into my hex editor up here. I'm not going to save it this time, right? This is uh, 893. That's the ASCII value of an 8. That's an ASCII value of a 9. That's an ASCII value of a 3. And if we went over here and we looked, we could find those, right? There's an 8, and there's a 9, and there's a 3, and they ought to match what we just saw, hexadecimal 38, and 39, and 33. It's completely different than 893 as an integer or a decimal value. Wait, as an integer or as a float. I'm going to cheat and see if I can convince Google to show me what that is in binary. All right. Eight ninety three as an integer is ta da. So what in the world does that mean? What do all those zeros and ones mean? But just like when you're counting in decimal, you have a When we're counting in our counting system, we have a ones place, we have a tens place, we have a hundreds place, we have a thousands place, we have a ten thousands place. I'm not going to go much further than this. We have a hundred thousands place. 
Those are all powers of 10. This is 10 to the power of, how many zeros do we have there? Five? Yep. So that's 10 to the power of 5. This is 10 to the power of 4. 10 to the power of 3. 10 to the power of 2. 10 to the power of 1. And 10 to the power of 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. <coughs> Perhaps the exception of 0 to the power of 0. It's a mathematical proof that I could get up there and draw if I remember. Just remember that 2 to the power of 0 is 2. 8 to the power of 0 is Wait, 2 to the power of 0 is 1, 8 to the power of 0 is 1, anything to the power of 0 is 1. So, if we have this kind of number, whoopsie, if we have the number 2017, here's what this really means. I'm going to go ahead and fill in those place values. This means that we have 2 times 1,000 plus... No 100s, plus how many 10s do we have? We have 110. And how many in the 1s column? 7, right. And if we added those up, surprise, they would equal 217. We just converted from base 10 to base 10. We feel really accomplished. Now, we don't think of numbers in this sense because they're so deeply ingrained in us, right? You know, we've been counting since, you know, kindergarten or grade one or grade two or whatever, and we didn't know all the numbers roll over in this. And we don't think of the place values as being powers of 10 and stuff like that. That's a little more, bit more detailed than our brain usually thinks about. Them. Binary works the same way, except it's not powers of 10. It's powers of 2. So you have 1, 2, 4, 8. 16, 32, and I hope the people who are looking at their phone and stuff already know all this stuff, which is 2 to the power power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3, 2 to the power of 4, this is tedious, 2 to the power of 5. If we have 8 bits, we will keep going. This is just 5, right? We could add 3 more columns. 2 to the power of 6, 2 to the power of 7, 2 to the power of 8. Now binary, the counting system in which we only have two possible values. So we're not going to have 0, 0, 2, 0, 1, 7. They're all going to be either one, zeros or 1s. Like that. Now I could ask Google to tell me what 010110 in binary is in our counting system, but we can also convert it. How many 32s do we have? None, so I'm not going to even write it. How many 16s do we have? We got one, so 16 plus how many 8s? None, but we do have a 4 plus a 4. Do we have any 2s? And no 1s, so Looks like 22. Now I'm going to confirm that with Google. What I said it was 22? Yep, and that's what that is. So if I had the number 22, that's how it is stored in the computer's RAM as just a series of digits. Now this is not, these are not ASCII values. If we wanted to pad this out, to 8 bits, it would look like this. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. That, that's 8, right? Nope. I put in one too many. There we go. So, but that is not an ASCII 22. If we look that up, that is just... That's one single character on the ASCII table, right? Just one single character. It's not even a printable character. We looked it up. That is a, a synchronous idle, right? It's not a number. So strings are stored 
as sequences of ASCII or Unicode values. Well, what's Unicode mean? These are 8-bit character sets, right? We have one of 255 different letters. Well, 255 different characters isn't enough to hold Japanese and Russian and Swahili and Klingon and Elvish and, and, and all the different emoticons that people like, emoji that people like to use. So, making a larger character set that had more than 8 bits, <coughs> multi-byte character set allows you to store, you know, the entirety of all the, uh, although, you know, your font designer probably isn't going to be adding, you know, all of the uh, Japanese and the Klingon and whatever character sets. That way, all of them can be stored in one single character set. So if you're sitting down and you're typing in Word, as long as your font can support it and your keyboard can support it, you can put anything on there that you want. And there's no switching of modes anymore. You don't have to say, I want to view this web page in Russian or I want to view this web page in, in, you know, in Korean or whatever. It just does it. So ASCII are 8 bit codes representing typewriter symbols. Unicode equals multi byte, usually 16 bit, representing every character in every language that's been added to it. People knew, and uh, every emoji. Next time, if somebody wants to make a, you know, a purple-hatted alien waving a flag, and they add that to your iPhone and your Android, then that, that's an, there's a, an emoji consortium that adds that to the Unicode spec. Otherwise, you know, how would everybody agree that, you know, that that specific symbol was supposed to be this on every platform that you looked at it? According to where we were with this, that's okay. So if we set name equal to Alan Turing and then we print out name subscript zero, we get the A. If we print out name subscript three, well, that's character zero, one, two, three. So that would be the N. If you start counting from using negative numbers, it goes to the back. It starts backwards. So name minus 1 is G. Name subscript minus 2 is N. This is an index-based loop for printing out all the elements of the data stream. For index, I just used I. In range of the length of the string, print out that index number and that value, and so it prints out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then each character in that string. Character 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Back to slicing. If we have this string, name is equal to Darth Vader. Say I want to get that. I want to get V and I want to go all the way to the end of the string. Well, I could do this. I could do print in subscript and I need to find the subscript for that. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So starting at 6, and I happen to know that Vader is 5 characters long, so I could go out to 11, right, something like that. And it should print out Vader. But what if he had decided to change his name? And it's just Vado. That kind of worked, actually, but that wasn't the point that I was going for. Sorry. If you leave off, or what if his last name has become longer? 
It's still only going to print Vader. It's not going to print the entirety of the last name. We would have to update that. Or you leave it out. If you leave it out, then it skips, it continues all the way to the end of the string, or all the way to the end of the list. So our, our slice of the string starts at the specified character, but since we did not specify a second value, it goes to the end of the string. So if you leave out the second value of the slice, it will go to the end of the string or the list. What if you leave out the first one? It starts at zero. Now to me, that's kind of a big whoop because we saved a whole single character by not typing in zero colon, right, and just typing in colon. But this is really useful because I don't have to calculate the length of the list, right? If I was going to calculate the length of the list, I'd have to use the len function and I, you know, stuff like that. And I'm glad that I can just leave that off and it'll go straight to the end of the list. That is a very convenient thing to do. What if we wanted to know where the space was in this? Eh, let me go back and start following the PowerPoints again. So, here's the use of the in keyword to see if something is true or not. Is there a .txt in our file name? Yeah, there sure is. There's a .txt in our file name. So, this would print out the file name. What they have done here is they've created a list of three file names, and then they say for file name and file list, if there's a, yeah, let, let's do that ourselves. Let's do that ourselves. We're going to make a list. Three file names t.txt, end quote, comma, quote, pr.1.py, py, end quote, comma, test.exe, end quote, comma, and then one more, hello.txt. They can really be anything, but uh, I just want to make have like one of them be an executable. So for V and L, for every value in the list, or for E and L, I don't mind doing either one, or I could do a whole word like, you know, but for V and L, or for file name in L, if dot exe, end quote, in in space file name colon print file name comma is an executable end quote in parentheses elif Now let's check for the text files. So elif, quote, dot txt, end quote, space, in, space, file name, colon, print, file name, comma, quote, is a text file. And I'm just going to leave off the Python files. And so test.exe is an executable, hello.txt is a text file, t.txt is a text file. Would not take much time to add the py script, the py files to that. Matter of fact, why don't you do that while I'm looking at the next thing. If you get these typed in, add one more that says elif.py, print is a Python file. Elif, because you're checking one more condition. Yes, you could do this. You could do else print unrecognized file, but instead we specifically want to find if it's a Python file. Just a second. And I close my act. All right, 
that. So while the recording was paused, I added a homework assignment to the bottom of it. But this is the last thing I added here, is I wanted to print the string, and I wanted to print the uppercase version of the string. So it printed out both the string, it printed out the uppercase version, and if I did dot lower, print s dot lower, parentheses in parentheses, like that, it's going to print the lowercase. Now why is that useful? What if you ask them to type in y to continue? It's kind of annoying to have to check to see if they typed in an uppercase y and a lowercase y, <laughs> things like that. So we're going to get a request. We're going to ask them something. R for response is equal to input parentheses quote type yes to continue parentheses in parentheses or end quote in parentheses. Now what if we wanted to check for every permutation, right? We could check to see, check for yes, comma, yes, comma, yes, comma, y, comma, y, right? We could have to check for all sorts of permutations if we're not going to just be super picky and make them do it exactly. Or we could do this, if r subscript 0 in subscript dot upper parentheses in parentheses equals equals quote y end quote and that would count that would get all of them it'll get anything that starts with yes you know even if they type in yay or yak right it would still continue print yes indeed, end quote, else colon, print, nope, in parentheses, like that. So if you're asking for a word for input, and you want to allow that, you know, if it's supposed to be a prompt for whether they're continuing or not, this is a, a quick and easy way of making your program a little bit more fail safe, all right? Rather than failing because they typed in Y with a lowercase or they didn't type out the complete word or whatever. All righty. I needed to have wandered around and make sure that everybody had this going. I'm going to go ahead and make a Dropbox and then I'll wander and then I'll give you all the solution for the checking to see if it's a Python file. So just a sec. There's a Dropbox M. The solution for that last thing I asked y'all to add, which was uh, having it print out if it's a Python file or not, would have looked something like this. LF quote dot py end quote in file name colon print parentheses file name comma quote is a Python script. Python file or whatever you want to call it. And we might put on a dangling else in there because it might be none of the above. Print file name comma is something. <laughs> right. Unrecognized. Apparently, I didn't put any unrecognized files in there. I only had the three types, right? But I could change one of them to be something else, like hello.doc. It doesn't know what a doc is. 